Your Excellency, Mr. Saba Korossi, President of the 75th, 7th Session of General Assembly, Your Excellency, Mr. Antonio Guterres, UN Secretary General, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, at the heart of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. This is the principle this UN body committed to. But today, over three and a half years after that commitment was made, smaller nations and younger democracies around the world already feel like this is an empty promise, left behind but feel much farther behind than before. For instance, we all know that climate change is a global problem that will never be solved unless all nations solve it together. Yet months after Malawi and its SDG gains were set backwards by two, we all know that pandemics are a global problem that will never be solved unless all nations solve it together. Yet in the rollout of vaccines and application of travel restriction, we have been left behind. We all know that regional insecurity is a global problem that will never be solved unless all nations, we have been left behind. And we all know that food shortage is a global problem that will never be solved and till all nations solve it together, yet in the allocation of international facilities for agro-based and debt-distressed economies, we have been left behind. And as a result of our collect collective negligence, the global economy pushes out to safety while leaving the rest of us behind to fend for ourselves in the burning building. But if we are truly one UN family, then leaving no one behind has to be practiced, not just preached. If we are truly one UN family, we must reject any attempts to politicize human suffering by lobbying us to refuse the help of those. We must get out of political posturing and welcome more helping hands in resolving the problems the permanent UN Security Council members have sometimes created and which they have failed to solve alone, namely the failure to stop environmental degradation, the failure to prevent unjust wars, the failure to lift unsustainable debt burdens, the failure to prevent food insecurity, How do we get back on track? As I see it, with so many left behind, the only thing to do is to concentrate the UN's support on the most vulnerable who are lagging behind so that they can catch up. And Malawi stands ready to do its part in using any new support we get. Malawi is ready to catch up having just joined the Feed the Future initiative, given us access to new financing in the next few years to use Malawi's vast arable land and large volumes of fresh water to develop mega farms that will feed the world and lift millions out of our, uh, of our farmers out of to join the agricultural revolution that is coming to Malawi as well as investors in mining who know that the recent discovery in Malawi of the largest deposit of rutile in the world means that Malawi's economic rise is imminent. On climate change mitigation and adaptation, around the corner in Chamarishek, we call for action on the pledges already made 
so that Malawi and other least developed countries can build resilience to climate change-induced events like floods, drought, pests, and cyclones, all projected to become more frequent and more severe. These disasters are reversed in years of developmental gains. Cyclones Anna and Gombe alone, a fifth of our people are at risk of acute food short shortage as 3.6 million Malawians are facing hunger from next month until March. While we are preparing to deploy food assistance from our strategic reserves, we welcome your support with early warning systems for generating and managing climate data. Building in weather data analysis, modeling and forecasting to address barriers faced by farmers in accessing useful information. Our ongoing institutionalization of the climate or National Climate Change Fund should help in this regard, as will other measures for making climate financing predictable. Although Malawi and other least developed countries own ambition is to cut carbon emissions by half before the year 2040. And so we call for our support towards our efforts to transition to clean and green energy. On dealing with the evolving challenge of COVID-19, Malawi again is ready to catch up. Crucial to this will strengthen our vaccine delivery systems in general. But the critical need for us is strengthening health systems more broadly to build resilience against future pandemics, which calls for investments in health infrastructure and research. And in this context, the news that six African states have been chosen to produce and I'm proud of Malawi's advocacy of this approach, as well as Malawi's role as a co pioneer of the Accord for a Healthier World, announced by Pfizer in Davos four months ago. Aimed at bringing quality medicines to 1.2 billion people in low-income countries, these action-oriented partnerships are examples of the importance of SDGs fully. And Malawi has so far undertaken two voluntary national reviews, VNRs, since 2020, to strengthen the national ownership of the same. But we see global public, uh, private public partnerships as essential to reclaiming the gains we have lost on SDGs in the recent months of global crisis. It is because of our collaborative of reviewing the UN Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework for the period 2024 to 2028 so that it is responsive to national development plans linked to the delivery of the SDGs. And in that spirit of partnership, we also plan to make full use of the Doha Program of Action for LDCs to catch up on SDGs even more. And speaking of LDCs, countries to be held in Doha, Qatar in March 2023, where even more partnerships will be forged around creating solutions for vulnerable countries. One problem in desperate need of a solution for the most vulnerable LDCs is the unsustainable debt levels and distress they bear. It is not for nothing debt as a form of slavery. And as leaders of generations past work together to end old forms of slavery, we too must work together to end this new form. Recently, the managing director of the International Monetary Fund called on the world's major debts that are shackling them because even loans that were given and received in good faith have become unsustainable 
in the recent and current climate relentless of unseen, uh, for unforeseen external shocks. So I join her in reiterating that call, and I commend the People's Republic of China Operation FOCAP to forgive interest-free loans owned by 17 African countries. Let this be the beginning of a breaking of the chains holding vulnerable countries back, not the end. Because when we say that we are leaving no one behind, this is one way to put our money where our mouth is. Regard my country as entitled to such. And I am in fact fully committed to be held accountable for the responsible use of these life jackets. I recognize that we too must prove ourselves worthy of such assistance by using it to cushion our citizens against the worsening financial. There must, in fact, be no member state in our midst that is beyond scrutiny or exempt from accountability. For that to, be, to become a reality, U.S. President Biden's recent call for this U.N. family to defend the rights of smaller nations as equals of larger ones, we do not wish to gather here next year with no progress made on the African Union's Azuluan consensus, which demands that two permanent seats with veto power and five non-permanent seats must go to Africa. So following the strong signal of support from the U.S. government to be heard and to be settled, that is the UN we want. That is the UN the world needs. A reformed UN that practices the equality and democracy it preaches. A reformed UN that is not constantly polarized by nuclear power stuck in Cold War mindsets. A reformed UN that food security, insecurity, climate change, and conflict regardless of where they emerge or who they affect. A reformed UN that gives equal weight to all its members who give it meaning, not just those who give it money. Because we are one humanity facing the same storm in the same boat. And in that spirit of one humanity, let me conclude on the Commonwealth on the passing of Queen Elizabeth II who was laid to rest on the eve of this Assembly's high-level debate week. Mr. Saba Korossi, President of the 77th Session of the United Nations General Assembly, I thank you for this opportunity, and I congratulate you on your appointment, just as I wish outgoing and the cause to leave no one behind. Thank you all for listening.